like all the buildings. Yeah. Okay, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the STEM education you know? seminar for spring 2022. What an exciting time it is for us to have a seminar in person again after several semesters when we had online via Zoom seminars each semester. Uh, our speaker this afternoon is Dr. Matt Campbell from West Virginia University. He's an associate professor there of mathematics education. And uh, his work focuses on practice-based teacher education pedagogies and also investigations uh, into innovative and transformative uh, policies and programmatic pathways to recruit, uh, prepare, support, and retain high quality teachers, particularly in rural contexts. He will introduce his to topic for today's talk himself, uh, but I want to uh, make one uh, logistic kind of an announcement before I turn it over to him, and that is those of you who are on Zoom, when it is time to ask a question, or even while uh, Dr. Campbell is giving his talk, please put your questions in the chat. Uh, Dr. Ron Gray here is managing the chat, and when it's time to respond to questions, he will read out your question, and then uh, Dr. Campbell will provide a response to your questions. We are doing that just to avoid any sound issues back and forth between this room and wherever you are on Zoom. So it's easiest and best to just do it via chat. Okay. Uh, with that, I'd like you to join me in welcoming Dr. Campbell. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's great to be here. Great to be able to spend some time uh, here in Flagstaff. Be out of my dining room chair and answering emails. <laughs> so this has been a lovely, a lovely trip. Um, so yes, I'm Matt Campbell, of West Virginia University, um, and I'm going to talk today about uh, what has really been a decade's worth of work around uh, work with practice-based uh, teacher education pedagogies, specifically uh, what are called approximations of practice. Um, and so I'm going to try to show some, some concrete examples of that work, um, try to share a little bit of detail in terms of the, the design thought that's went into that work, and then share some learnings that have uh, played out over that time, um, uh, both in research and practice, thinking about that work. Um, so we're going to start with uh, just an, uh, an opportunity to look at some examples and just see what stands out to us. We'll see what we notice, what do we wonder. Um, I'll provide some brief background on practice-based pedagogies in general, um, and then share a little bit of detail on my work specifically with coached rehearsals, what are called scripting tasks. And specifically, my work is in uh, secondary math methods courses. I'll then close with three considerations that I think have, for me, stood out in the work that go beyond some of the nuts and bolts of, of doing this work in a context like methods courses. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about those, but things that I think are, are helpful to think about um, when you're entering into this work. And I want to start with some acknowledgments. So one of my uh, now longtime collaborators uh, with this work is Dr. Aaron, Aaron Baldinger at the University of Minnesota. Um, we've been collaborating for the past seven years in this space, and a lot of the publications I'll mention have been co-authored with her, as well as Foster Grafe, who's now at St. Cloud University. He was a grad student at um, Minnesota. Currently, I get to work with uh, two doc students, Josh Carr and Sean Freeland, to continue thinking about these ideas. And... Um, the origins of some of this thinking occurred during my doc program at uh, Oregon State University. My advisor, Rebecca Elliott, as well as my colleague, Ron Gray, who has been an interesting uh, thought partner in those early days and even today, thinking about what are some of the similarities and differences across science and math as we think about this work. Ultimately realizing that what gets done is a series of decisions that you make. It's not the only set of decisions, but it's uh, ones that I've found to be useful decisions so far. So like I said, we're going to start with uh, some opportunities to see some examples. And all I ask you to do is as you watch this the video clip, uh, I want you to see what do you, what, what do you notice? What stands out to you? Or what are some questions you would ask um, as you watch this clip? Um, 
the top right there is a table uh, with some uh, paired values. That is what's being discussed in the, the class. So you have a little bit more um, visibility of that. So here we go. Okay, so we'll just open up the floor, including on Zoom. Anything you notice or wonder about what you saw in that clip? Well, I think linear functions is taught mainly in middle schools. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, but I noticed that the students discussing this question is absolutely not at that age. <laughs> That's an interesting observation, yes. Okay, so there's a noticing what content is being discussed and who seems to be in the room. There's some dissonance between those things. Yeah. Uh, well, I noticed that um, the, the individual at the whiteboard seems to be 
leading the discussion, but he's very novice, um, or at least it appears that way. And the gentleman that is sitting down has been coaching him, if you will, like ask this question, or why don't you draw this over here? So uh, I feel like this is more of a practice, maybe. I'm wondering, that's a wonder, uh, if that might be a practice. Right. So session for him. sizing up kind of who's in what role and trying to understand the scene a little differently, right? Pick one or two more ideas. I think he's he's trying out some things. He's trying out representing what they're saying. Mm -hmm. So he's going back to them to say, did I did I represent that correctly? Is, did I, am I using the right words? Um, which is obviously something he's trying to, to work on. Yeah, so we can see specific things that are happening instructionally um, from this individual. And that may be new things he's trying out or right. things that he just maybe does more routinely. And in, in trying those things out, it seems like there is a progression or a shift from this particular card being considered a non-example to begin with and getting towards the idea that it is actually an example rather than a non-example. Nice. So we see a, a shift in some of the students thinking or the way in which this particular idea is being discussed or uh, being classified as a, a certain kind of function perhaps. Great. So we're going to come back to this clip uh, later on. Um, one other thing I want to uh, get you to think about for the same reason is um, I'm just going to share a little bit of this and I'm going to have you notice and wonder um, some text on the next slide. But to set the scene, um, we're imagining a scenario where a task is given to a class of students. Um, it is called Journey to the Bus Stop. It's a distance uh, time graph where uh, representing a, a, a child's walk to the bus stop over you know, one morning. And um, it then says, after students have had the opportunity to work in small groups, the teacher brings the whole class uh, together for a discussion. Teacher, who would like to share their description of Tom's journey? Foster, thanks for volunteering. Foster says, Tom walked up a hill, down a hill, and up another hill to get to the bus stop. <laughs> so I'd like for you to look at these two um, sets of text and see what you notice or what you wonder. Okay, so you might still be looking at it, but does anyone have any noticings or wonderings from these examples? There's definitely a difference in how many students are responding. Okay, right. So on the left, just one. It's going back and forth between one student and the teacher. On the right, the teacher is trying to get more people involved. Great. I also notice on the left that teacher is trying to focus attention on what the values of the x and y axis are to help with the interpretation, whereas the teacher on the right is just asking for open, very open ended responses in terms of having you interpret the graph without kind of focusing some attention. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah, so we see maybe the teacher doing different kinds of work or making different uh, kinds of contributions in what they're saying. These are have maybe some more mathematical substance that's coming from the teacher himself um, and something different in the, on the script on the right. On the, on the right side, 
there is a mention of wait time at right. least once. There is none over on the other side. We don't know whether there was wait time used in other places or not. That's interesting. So here we at least get some sort of stylistic uh, uh, reference to something happening that's not spoken, which may or may not be happening here, but we at least see it more explicitly on the right. So again, we're going to revisit this um, as well as, as we move along. But this, these are two examples of uh, that'll get us thinking about um, what I've been using as coach rehearsals that we we'll call scripting tasks. So just to provide some background, we think about practice-based teacher education. Practice-based teacher education is not new. Um, there have been several moments of this, in fact, um, but it's those, those moments have evolved. And there's been sort of a back and forth to how teacher education has been viewed and what, what there's been a focus on um, preceding this current moment of uh, practice-based teacher education was more of a focus on teacher knowledge and teacher beliefs. And it's not to say those things aren't being focused on in the current moment, but it was a very exclusive focus then. Previous instances of what would be called practice-based teacher education would be um, efforts to really try to define and delineate what are the things that teachers do um, in a way that was almost too parsed apart and microscopic. Um, so the current moment, in a way, starts with um, Ball and Cohen's work from 1999 which really spoke a new language about how to situate professional learning and our understanding of what teachers do in a sense of what the practice of teaching is. Um, more recently, um, this sort of moment really took off when we think about Grossman and McDonald's call for two things. One, a common language of teaching, as well as um, moving toward more what they call pedagogies of enactment. That in teacher education, there was too much time spent not actually doing the work of teaching or having opportunities to do that. And again, this was a shift from what they saw as an exclusive focus on knowledge and beliefs. Magdalene Lampert um, highlighted this idea of what is the practice of teaching and different ways we might define that. Um, one of those definitions includes a sense of what it is that teachers as a collective do. And how do they do that work skillfully? What are the resources that need to be part of that? And where this has all led are two interrelated strands of ideas. What's been called the core practices movement, as well as um, a focus on pedagogies of practice. I do want to note there have been some recent critiques of practice-based teacher education, um, particularly on what has been called too much of a focus on practice as the core and the way in which that perpetuates um, a lack of attention to and even um, uh, perpetuating of inequities in classrooms. Huh. I say that as a bit of context, I'll so mention it again in a little bit, but it's worth noting. Um, and so where we'll go here and what the focus is going to be on are what have been called uh, pedagogies of practice in teacher education, um, stemming from some other work from Grossman and colleagues, where they highlighted three pedagogies that they noticed in other types of pro professional preparation that were less common um, in teacher education, or aspects were less common in teacher education. Representations of practice are pretty common. We think about the opportunity to observe teaching, we think about uh, videos of teaching, we think about written cases, student work, things that um, show to us and document to us what's going on in teaching. The decomposition of practice is trying to understand what are the component parts of the work of teaching. Part of what hinders that in teaching specifically is what they have said is really not a shared language for what are the parts of teaching. So it's hard to understand that um, through unpacking it. What we're going to focus today is on what we're called approximations of practice, which are opportunities for that enactment that is often lacking in teacher education outside of clinical placements or whatever um, to focus on core components of the work of teaching in situations of reduced complexity. I'm going to come back to parts of that definition um, in terms of how we would understand what does it mean to uh, have reduced complexity, um, but this is, uh, this is where we're going to focus here. So my background with these practice-based pedagogies started with a focus on the sort of early level, rep often representations of practice, as well as um, a, an attention to a different kind of situating the work of teacher learning in practice. 
Um, so using video, using student work, using uh, tasks that were designed to support teachers to develop their own mathematical knowledge as teachers, MKT, mathematical knowledge for teachers. That was early in my doctoral program. Partway through my doctoral program is when there was a, a surge of new ideas around the use of rehearsals, particularly in elementary math um, methods courses. Um, and so I, along with my advisor, took up this idea in the secondary context, and we're trying to find our way through how we would do that with the noted difference between secondary and elementary. My dissertation, um, focused on what I called responsive pedagogies of practice, where we really try to understand the design, particularly of rehearsals, in concert with school placements. Um, so both the methods class, as well as opportunities to practice out in the field. And since I started at WVU and in my work with um, Aaron Baldinger, we've been um, specifically focused on the use of coach rehearsals, and scripting tasks in our math methods courses at our respective institutions. And in particular, we focused on the practice of responding to student errors in whole class discussions. So when a student says something that's imprecise, unexpected, incorrect, incomplete, um, we've been careful on how, in terms of how we position student errors. It's an asset. It is the resources that students bring to those moments, but we've, it's been cleaner for us to call them errors and then to explain what we mean after that. But when those things happen, um, and specifically in the context of whole class discussion, so not on a test, not in small groups, we've specifically focused on those whole group um, discussions. So a coach rehearsal, that was the first example we saw, just a little background on what that is. So a teacher candidate would lead a defined activity with their peers or other teacher educators as um, the students. And hopefully there's a focus on a particular practice or set of practices. So like I said, in our case, we focused on this moment of responding to errors in the whole class discussion. It's clear to differentiate rehearsals from what's often called micro teaching in part because it's more bounded and it's often more purposefully focused on certain things in certain ways. Um, another thing is that there is in the moment coaching happening from a teacher educator. That might be um, responding to questions, offering different um, suggestions of, of ways to go about what they're doing differently, or to open up opportunities about the problems that arise in practice. So again, this idea of reduced complexity is what provides a space for someone to try out new things with a lot less risk because it's not actual students, um, and, and to support their own learning. But it's clear to realize that this is not an oversimplification of practice. You still want to have something that is not so broken up that it's disconnected from what really happens in teaching, um, in part because teaching is an interactive work, right? And so what has to happen in these rehearsals is that um, uh, a teacher, teacher candidate has to be responding to student thinking, has to be interacting with students. Um, and be responsive to those ideas. So that maintains some complexity and integrity to the work. I'm gonna give you some more video images from coach rehearsals. These are particularly moments of coaching just to see how that, what prompts those um, interactions and what those interactions might look like.
Okay, so again, just some, some examples to give you a bit more context of what this might look like in practice. Um, so a little more detail too on, on how I've used coach rehearsals and, and again, in, in my um, collaborations with, with Dr. Baldinger. Um, one of the things that has framed this work, um, in, including in the elementary space, is this idea of an instructional activity. It's that bounded thing that's what gets rehearsed. Um, what we've done is one, focus on activities that are about leading whole class discussion, because that's our focus. And then um, we've landed at a place where we draw on common instructional routines in classrooms, such as number talks, sorting tasks, what are called representation talks, even just the act of what happens when you give students a problem and you talk about it um, in review. Um, some of these things are, are ideas we published just as the activity um, in the NCTM journals. Um, and then so we, we see a, a potential crossover for not just activities that teachers could use in classrooms, but spaces that could structure teacher learning through something like the rehearsal. Now it's interesting, even just earlier today, I mean, it's, there is a lot of thought, well, like, what about a whole lesson? Or what about a unit? You know, so we've made a choice of a grain size of activity that we focused on. It's not the only answer. We've landed there for certain reasons, but um, I think it's important to note that that's a continual thing to think about. Um, again, it's a decision you make and likely a decision you make for, for good reasons. And this has been where we've landed. Um, so, one teacher candidate at a time is the rehearsing teacher, and the other teacher candidates play the students. But we're very particular to say that we want them to act as themselves. There's some time, and I'll get more to that in a minute, but there's some inclination uh, for people to think, oh, I'm gonna act like a student. And I'll say it now, I'll say it later. They don't know how to act like students. They know how to act like extreme caricatures of students, which we talk about for a few reasons. One, it makes it horribly complex. So we've now removed that part of what this was all about in the first place. And two, it doesn't position students in a really positive way because it just has them saying kind of zany things. Um, so we've tried to be particularly thoughtful about that. We also say to our, our teacher candidates, people who already know the content. So that was a good observation. Right? These were not middle schoolers learning about linear functions themselves. That's going to be the easiest time, theoretically, for you to lead a discussion about linear functions, right? And so sometimes teacher candidates will say, oh, I would do better if it was real students because, you know, they might feel funny leading a discussion with their peers. And I go, I can assure you, it would not be easier with students <laughs> because <laughs> these folks at least know what's going on. Though you'd be surprised. Sometimes we actually tap into some um, uncertainties with the mathematics as well. But what we have done, and partly because of our focus on that practice of responding to errors, is we've um, been really thoughtful about how we might plant errors in the rehearsal with one teacher candidate. We also um, follow up with, with a possible range of activities. We have an initial debrief discussion where we might talk about some of those coaching moments after the fact. We might ask people to write reflections or actually annotate the video in reflection, highlight certain moments that stood out to them. Um, and, and we may, um, it's not happened much lately, but we may bring some of these activities as something to try out with students in classrooms. The other um, approximation of practice um, that I'm going to mention here is what are called scripting tasks. So we saw an example of this in the front end, where there is a classroom scenario, and teacher candidates produce a dialogue of classroom interaction in response to where that scenario leaves off. They also provide a rationale for why they continued the discussion in the way they did. So as an example, we have this journey to the bus stop example, where um, there actually would be a little bit more context given, like what's the goal of giving this task, and you know, it's a certain kind of class, an algebra one classroom or whatever. And um, uh, but then there is some amount of dialogue that's provided. And then importantly, these prompts are given to the teacher candidates. So one, imagine that you are the teacher, write the next seven to eight, or five to eight lines of dialogue for how you would continue this discussion. Provide a rationale for why you decided to continue the discussion in this way. Then we actually ask them to focus on the student in the scenario. 
So what do you think Foster is thinking about the distance and time graph based on what he said and what was provided? Or what he said and what was provided? And how would you want to see Foster's thinking shift during the ensuing discussion? Um, and yes or no, and then if so, how would you want that to happen? So something to note about scripting tasks is that they're less authentic than coached rehearsals for a few reasons. One, it's not an actual active inter interaction with other people. In fact, what's really interesting is the teacher candidate actually has to create the words that the student says. They have total control of what happens in this situation, and it still creates amazing outcomes, <laughs> amazingly diverse outcomes. They have more time. They also have more time to act, right? You think about a rehearsal, you think about teaching, you're acting in the moment, right? In fact, we try to encourage people, you know, you can take a moment to think about what you're gonna do. With a scripting task, you have a lot more time to think through it. However, be, partly because of that, um, lesser authenticity, it actually provides some different opportunities for teacher candidates and teacher educators. Well, I'll talk about some more of those in a bit, but one of those um, affordances is that a teacher educator could give the same scripting task to the whole class of teacher candidates, whereas a rehearsal, one person at a time is doing the rehearsal. We use scripting tasks in a way um, that used to be a pre-post but wasn't actually a pedagogical part of the teacher candidate's experience. It was a way really for us to think about our research. And it was pretty dissatisfying. It wasn't very useful. So we've started to incorporate those scripting tasks more into the activities of the, the methods class, particularly early in the semester where we take that same graph scripting task, we give it to the teacher candidates to complete, and then we engage in a series in the next week or two, a series of in-class discussions where we give them a, a set of example scripts to that same scenario, and we ask them in groups to sort them and characterize them. We also give them a single graph script, not one of theirs, but a single graph script that as a group we ask them to revise, to evaluate and revise, and then they go back and revise their script. We've also created other scripting tasks that align with our different rehearsal cycles. So the same instructional activities serve as the context of those uh, scenarios in the scripting tasks. At the end of the semester, we have them look across all of their scripting task responses and think about what they've been doing over those. And then they complete the graph scripting task and do one more time at the end of the semester. So these scripts from earlier, you might be interested to know that these are written by the same person here and here. So all those changes came from the discussions that were had in groups, including stylistic things like, oh, I could add another student. Oh, I could have a mention of I recorded something or I'm explicitly offering wait time. They might have gotten that idea from talking with other people or seeing other examples. So just in that short time, we have a very different vision for how that discussion would play out. Another thing I want to highlight and, and that we've evolved you know, into is it's really important to know what kind of teacher learning you're looking to support. One of the critiques of practice-based teacher education is that it's too focused on just the actions that teachers do, just the moves they make. Um, which is part of what we're interested in. But we also want to know how does this work give them a different vision for what can happen in classrooms? How does it give them different dispositions about um, uh, students' ideas and, and the mathematics itself? And then how do they understand um, the content of the mathematics and the students with whom they work in different ways as a result of working with these approximations and practice? This doesn't have to be the framework of teacher learning you use. This is from Havertus and colleagues. But for us, it's been really helpful to, to move outside of just thinking about what move did they use in the rehearsal or did they write down in the script? Because we used to just be like, oh, great, they used a revoicing. Oh, well, great, they, they used a turn and talk move. And, but there was something missing there. It's, it's, it's a little hollow. So I want to um, wrap up with um, three considerations that have emerged from research we've done in this work and just our practice as teacher educators. Um, and to start, 
um, I want to talk about this idea of representing student talk, a student voice. So what a teacher does in a moment of teaching is necessarily an interaction with what students offer, their actions, their contributions. So what's been made apparent is that when you decide how to set up a rehearsal, or how to set up a scripting task, for example, it's really important to make choices about how is it that students are being represented. It could be what mathematical ideas they're saying, it could be their identities that are being represented. It could be social dynamics that are playing out. You have to make purposeful choices about what it is that you want to have made visible through that work. And one way that that's happened is with these, this idea of planted errors. So we saw one example of a planted error in the initial clip where the student who eventually came to be convinced had initially offered a contribution that he was told to offer. Here's another clip where that happens around a different, um, a similar sorting task, but different content. So in our early use of planted errors, this is an episode that occurred, and we found it really problematic because in this case, the person who offered the planted error was just left eventually to just sort of concede to this other idea. Now, granted, it's a different kind of error than we see in this other instance, but in that instance, the, the student offered the, um, the error. It wasn't really immediately dug into. It came up again. The student had an opportunity to reevaluate his idea. He didn't change his idea. And then after another contribution, he saw something different. So this was a product of a change to what we did with the planted errors, where in our first run, this is what people were doing. They were told which rehearsal this was a part of. They were told when they should try to offer this idea in the rehearsal. So for the very first clip we watched, a student was told to highlight that table D was a non-example of a linear function because of the way that the values in the Y column don't increase by the same amount. The one that was offered in the clip we just watched was very similar. It said, you know, pick this card and say, I think this is the Y intercept and this is the slope. But that used to be it, right? And what we realized was not just with that clip, but there, most of the planet errors did not seem to give a good opportunity to focus on uh, responding to errors. So what we added then were additional notes that essentially boil down to explicitly telling the person what will not convince you and what would have to convince you to change your mind. 
And so what we see in that very first clip we watched was the information that had been put out from other students and represented by the teacher fell into this category. This were, these would not be things that would convince you. But when those other ideas did come out, that student know, knew, oh, I can sort of play into this a little differently. Why that matters, and we've written about this um, in a few different places, but why that matters is that in classrooms, teachers respond to students and their sense making, which means what, that, what it is that students say is authentic. They mean it. And when students say things in a rehearsal, we need to reflect that, right? It has to be mathematically reasonable as something that a high school student or middle school student might say, but it also has to be something that the person saying it actually means. And if you just end up with, oh, like that's, they didn't mean it, right? He didn't actually own that idea. And so it was really important that when we plant these errors, when we're representing student voice in a rehearsal, that this is actually like something a student would say because they would actually mean it. And this is important because for a teacher candidate, they have to know how to respond to students who mean what they say. And they have to value that student reasoning, and they have to have a vision for how a conversation could play out in which a student might get convinced of a different answer. And a lot of this speaks not just to the moves they use, but the vision and disposition and understandings they have about teaching and students. Another thing, kind of overarching thought, is this idea of authenticity and complexity. And so typically we think of authenticity as a matter of setting. You know, is this in a real classroom with real students or is it in the university classroom? How much planning did the teacher candidate have to do themselves versus what were they given? Well, I've found other ways to think about authenticity and complexity. That idea of student thinking is one of those ideas. If we, give, if we create situations where they're responding meaningfully to students, that is uh, one way to think about authenticity in part because it holds the teacher kind of accountable to do things that would actually move the conversation along. Pre prior to that, it was just like the conversation moved itself along. So the teacher candidate wasn't really learning it because they weren't held accountable to do things that would actually be responded to in a reasonable way. Another thing to think about is sometimes we, we think that more authentic is better, that we should build up to something that's more authentic in our use of approximations of practice. And I would argue that that's not always the case. In part, we might think about a scripting task, a, a scripting task as being relatively less authentic compared to a uh, coach rehearsal. But there are affordances to using scripting tasks. In some ways, the things that cannot be created in a rehearsal. Um, you can better kind of craft the situation that's being um, dealt with by the teacher candidate. The teacher candidate is directly linking the script with the rationale. There's also an opportunity to have more control over issues that cannot be approximated with a room of people Things like race, things like gender, things like issues of equ equity and inequity that might happen in a classroom, you might not be able to responsibly <laughs> approximate that with real people in a rehearsal. You might have to create that through animations or through uh, text scripts. So just because these things are less authentic doesn't mean that they don't have their own benefits and merit. And so it's important that a teacher candidate or a teacher educator weaves these different forms of approximation together. The last kind of overarching point is um, where I think and this has been uh, an area of research, but I think it's helpful as a teacher educator to realize that these approximations can be set up to reveal the resources that teachers bring forward, the teacher candidates bring forward, and how those resources might develop further. Um, so some of the planted error work that we did was really about um, opportunities for learning. We've also thought about how does actual learning or moment in time resources, how can those things be revealed through both scripting tasks and um, uh, rehearsals. So in the one paper, we've actually looked at cases of people who wrote scripts and did rehearsals and then wrote those final scripts and tried to map some learning that was happening across those. 
And again, it was key for us to think through that to be have a more robust form of a framework of teacher learning than just what moves are they using. So one last point here is that um, for a scripting task, for example, it's important to not just look at the script. So, we, um, so for example, take a look at this script. This is written to a different, um, a different scenario, but we'll get a sense of what's going on just by looking. So again, we see that one-on-one -on -one conversation between a teacher and a student. Um, and the student kind of realizes or an error because of a mathematical contribution from the teacher um, and is actually able to pretty articulately say why they were wrong in the first place or why this other idea is right. Well, initially we would look at that and go, oh, you know, the error came to resolution. The teacher kind of offered a lot of very specific mathematical ideas. Weren't saying that as a very good thing. Um, what was interesting about this script, for as straightforward as it was, is here was the rationale that the person wrote. And when you link across those two, you wonder to yourself, what does this person mean by a student figuring something out for themselves? <laughs> so if you ask this person to talk about what they value about teaching, what they value about student learning. They might say something like that, and you might go, oh, it's sounds pretty good. <laughs> well, that person's version of what a student figuring something out for themselves is this. And so we see how this sort of creates this dissonance between what resources is a person bringing forward um, as they think about teaching. If we look at these examples from earlier, we talked a little bit about those. Here's, a, and that's very powerful on its own. I'll give you a moment to read through the person's rationale for their revised script um, and what they saw in their original script. So again, through that very quick sequence of activities over a few weeks, this tech teacher candidate realized some of the flaws um, in the first script and why some of the offerings in the second script were maybe a little better. Um, and we get a sense of that just looking at the scripts, but actually talk, seeing why they did what they did was really helpful to draw a more complete picture. Again, not just of the moves, but to have less inference to draw um, and, and more concrete data around what is behind those decisions. So as a teacher educator, what I would say is if you're using uh, scripting tasks like this or, um, or rehearsals, is that this is how you know what, te what teacher candidates are bringing forward, right? So it's a form of formative assessment. Um, and, and you have to have, again, a sort of the way in which they're making their practice visible and a way for you to make sense of what they're making. And that could be pretty powerful. So some future final considerations. I think it's interesting to think about what, how does anything I shared here today stay, stay, stay stable as you change content areas, as you change context, as you change the focal practices, what stays the same, what changes, what's okay to change, what's okay to stay the same. I think those are questions that were are worth continuing to ask. Um, there's also a wondering a lot of the work with approximations of practices with pre-service teachers. So what would what might be different or similar to that with practicing teachers? And I've heard some people say, like, really be timid about that, especially with rehearsals, because with practicing teachers, the thought is, well, they have so much more expertise, they have so much more strongly held opinions, they're not going to be comfortable, whatever. My experience in, in, in talking with others has been if you build up a problem and a need that you know, a group of practicing teachers see, 
they realize, oh, we got to work on this. Well, this could be a way to work on it. And people that are very willing to do a rehearsal when you offered it as a way to work on the thing that they want to get better at. So it's more respecting their agency and choosing the problems that they pursue. And as a teacher, educator, professional developer, you can offer a pedagogy as a way to work on that thing. Should you be doing that? Um, and then again, I've mentioned it a few times, but it's interesting to think about how these types of pedagogies can be used specifically to, to disrupt inequities and prepare educators to disrupt inequities in the classroom. Um, and specifically to do so still with a focus on math or science, for example. Um, so one of the doc students I work with, Josh Carr, his dissertation right now has taken that on head on. So not to just look at issues of equity, but to be sure to do that more explicitly while still focusing on the context of math teaching and how teacher candidates can hold on to both things um, through some of these approximations in practice. So I appreciate you all being here. I'm happy to take questions. I hope you, you know, saw an example that was interesting. I'm happy to share the slides um, and happy to take any questions now. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, uh, I think if, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> If there are questions already in the chat, we can start with them. And then uh, as we progress, then people in the room can also ask their questions. They're, they're not they're going, so we can go with the room. First. Oh, OK. There aren't there any? OK. I, I, I have a wonder. <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah. So uh, the, I'm kind of intrigued by that scripted versus the practice, and I guess it seemed to me that you were talking about them discreetly. And I guess I'm wondering, is there ever a chance, and maybe you said it and I missed it, where someone scripts a, 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 um, a scenario and then has a chance to practice it and then go back and look at it? I'm just, I, just yeah. as, a, as a curiosity, so that what's in your head, yeah. then when you put it into practice, like, oh, I see that what works and what doesn't. So the short answer is no, but that's really interesting. So how it has played out in the past couple of years is that that, that increased uh, number of uh, instances of scripting tasks have come out after the round of rehearsals of that activity. In part because the rehearsal is what exposed the teacher candidates to the activity structure, the routine. So they do rehearsals around sorting tasks. And then the scripting task is about a sorting task. But one of the things that, we, that we've kind of felt is that for all the work we've done on the front end of the semester now with the graph and script and really bring that back as an object to consider, and to improve those additional scripting tasks by happening at the end of each of these cycles just kind of happens. And we played with ways to revisit those things at the end of the semester. But what that idea has me thinking is what might it look like for the scripting tasks to be before the rehearsals? And that is like the first tryout. And then, like you said, the rehearsal might further problematize the same way that looking at those scripts, we're like, wait, so this isn't how this would go. I'm going to write a different script. Well, maybe the same kind of thing would happen um, through the rehearsal. Maybe there's a similar uh, revision activity then to the script. I mean, that's a really interesting idea. But no, we haven't done it. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything in there? Yeah. Not yet. So I, I have a wonderment too. Yes. Since there's nothing I like how we're framing to... our question. Yeah. <laughs> you, you started the frame. Yeah. Yeah. You started with notice and wonder. So you've been noticing and wondering. So my wonderment is uh, you talked about how this helps to address the inequities, et cetera, in yeah. the classroom, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, so not just that, but broadly speaking, what's the impact of this on teacher practice when they are actually out in the classroom? Has that been looked at at all? Yeah. Um, 
we try to get money to look at that more and have okay. been unsuccess unsuccessful at that so far. Mm -hmm. um, no, again, the short answer is no. I think okay. there are, I would say my earlier work has at least more deliberately looked into um, what people go on to do and say a student teaching placement mm -hmm. which follows the methods course experience. Yeah. yeah. Um, and looking at some of those connections and what seems to track or not. Um, but no, I think there's been more, more effort in this work to understand the mechanics and benefits of it in, in the context of the methods course. But certainly if we're gonna think about, um, and we've moved to think about not just opportunities for learning, but evidence of learning, right. but to what extent is that learning um, persist um, yeah. into other other situations um, I think you know my conjecture would be you'd face a lot of the common pitfalls that you see in that shift across settings mm -hmm. um, the hope would be that these kinds of pedagogies better approximate those settings in a way that allow them to um, transfer if you will to those settings right. but um, that would definitely be an area to further explore um, not just to see if it's happening, but to understand why or why not it's right. happening or in what forms it's happening. Yeah. Um, yeah. And at what grain size. So like maybe someone would would uh, treat a student error better right. in certain contexts, mm -hmm. but then kind of the, the pressure gets on and all of a sudden they start acting in a different way. Mm -hmm. Or maybe they would decide, hey, I want to do more sorting tasks. And maybe in that container, they're really good at managing that discussion. But outside of that, in sort of day to day instruction, they're not. And so maybe there's something that gets preserved with the activity structure that doesn't quite live outside. So we've had some wonderings of what that might look like and how we might look at it. But um, in the past couple of years, I haven't helped that line of work either. But uh, with, with COVID, but yeah, that's I think it's a, a good a good wondering that we've had as well. Yeah, because ultimately it's about value added, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yes. No, right. So it's um, I mean, I think by and large, there's a there's a different satisfaction for what people feel they learn within sure. those methods course spaces. Mm -hmm. That is beneficial in its own right, mm -hmm. but um, but to what extent is it creating a different kind of teacher yeah. beyond is, is certainly important to ask. Yeah. So, so I'm going to ask, so, um, what, so one of the things that I've noticed in, in, in doing this, it, it, when they struggle, if you ask the question, well, what is your goal for this discussion, they often, often don't have it, yeah. right? And so how do you help them beforehand or think about and articulate what the intellectual goal is of that discussion so they have that in mind as they walk into it? Yeah, so so with a rehearsal, they're they're given um, there's the so let's say it's a sorting task. Um, might do four four teacher candidates might do a sorting task rehearsal. So that's another thing. Like, how do you get it to where everyone gets a chance to rehearse? And the way I've done it is over the course of the semester, everyone gets to rehearse something once, but not everything once. Um, and so, and then depending on the numbers, maybe twice, but um, so it's not that everyone's rehearsing everything. But let's say you have four people doing a sorting task. Um, the material, there's the general structure of what is a sorting task, what's the kind of protocol for that kind of an activity. And then the specific people, the, the people who are rehearsing are given more specific information like, here are the cards and here's the goal for this. And in that case, it's we're building a definition of whatever linear function that is stated this way. And so the idea is that as you're, you're taking up those cards being sorted one way or the other, as you're recording ideas, you're trying to see those components of that definition build up and then be able to kind of come together uh, it, for the students be able to see those come together. So they're given a goal um, and maybe given some more context. And the goals might take a different form for different activities. I still think there's the risk if there's that lack of ownership of the goal when they're essentially given this to rehearse. Um, I mean, 
I give it in advance, give them time to even plan. Um, so it's not like they're just like given this and they walk up and do it. So there's some amount of prep time. Um, but yeah, I think it, it is important. We, those things are included like goals to make clear, like you make decisions based in part on your goals. Mm -hmm. But the, the extent to which they're fully kind of owning those ideas, just like the student of the planted errors, like to what extent are they really owning those ideas to inform the decisions they make? I think it's a fair question because some of the, where they get lost would be in those moments where they don't quite know where they're going. Um, so the effort is to, to provide that context and provide, provide a bigger sense of math teaching that relies on um, the idea that it's goal directed um, in a way, that's what they're learning as well in all of this. Um, you know, how to make decisions that are informed by a goal. So sometimes the coaching would be, let's not go down this path because the coach also knows what that goal is and can help kind of highlight why a decision is made. It's not just because like that was a bad question, but if we're really focused on this, let's use this as an opportunity to get there. So. Still nothing in the chat? Nope, there you go. Lots of thank yous. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well. well. Any other questions from within the room? I still have a question, but I don't want to put you super on the spot. But when you talk about um, giving like students somewhat like rehearsed examples, of like addressing um, inequities, whether it be race or gender or anything yeah. like that. What would kind of an example of that be yeah, like? Absolutely. Um, so like I mentioned, um, doc student I work with, Josh Carr, um, he has used written, much more in depth written scenarios of classroom instances, as well as um, animations there's a tool it used to be called lesson sketch now it's called um, depict or something like that out of the university of michigan where you can create these like comic book storyboard kind of things um and so what he's been focused on is um in the context of doing mathematics that there might be certain social things that play out so like you know uh, a black male's uh, idea gets dismissed and a white female's gets taken up as more valuable. Of course, there you have gender and race at play. Um, so as a result, not just calling out things like gender and race in the, the text of the scenario um, or as apparently visible in the um, animation, but much more detail provided about what's been happening, what's the situation in this discussion, much more dialogue that's provided. So that the analysis of the scenario itself takes on its own part of the activity. And then something like a scripting pass to, and then to more um, deliberately uh, decompose that and talk about that as a group. Um, and then to, um, do something like a scripting pass where they might continue a discussion based on a uh, moment. And he's been using the idea of um, what Deborah Ball calls discretionary spaces, these sort of in the moment decisions where uh, an, an inequity can be uh, disrupted or can be reinforced. And so he's focused on these kind of often very subtle moments where there's an interaction. Sometimes people will work on things where there's like overt racist things said in the classroom and it's like yeah we want people to stand up and say no to that or whatever but um these are much more subtle and but it's done in the context of the mathematics so it's like <laughs> no there is something mathematically valuable about what that student said and it was dismissed and it was potentially dismissed because of something about the the social dynamics in the classroom so that has been a much more deliberate intent or attempt to um, put that more front and center in the representations of practice and in the approximations of practice. And so what he's done is he's used a similar framework 
to this, but has added to it to think about elements of um, teaching for social justice. So can you notice those moments? Can you name them? And can you actually confront them through action? Um, now, granted, again, it's, he's doing it in the context of approximations of practice, but it's been pretty cool uh, to see that play out. So I'm not claiming I've been moving into that space, but it's cool to think about. I mean, yes, from the, the, the socially agnostic viewpoint of let's treat students' contributions a little better, even if they're wrong, but, um, but he's taking on those issues of equity much more. Much square, more squarely. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for asking. Happy to uh, promote this work. It's very good stuff. I'm happy when the next person can be better than I am. Doesn't take much. <laughs> Doctoral students, any other questions you might have? Putting on the spot. Yeah. <laughs> I know we're I'm, I'm just providing point. encouragement to ask. <laughs> well, if not, still nothing in the chat, right? No, we're great. No we're questions. a little over time. So okay. All right. Yeah. Thank you so much, Matt. And thank you, everybody, yeah. for joining in. Thank you for being here. Coming out here. Absolutely. Thanks very much. And we are adjourned. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, <laughs> 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 <